Let me ask you to take your Bible and look with me in the Old Testament book of Hosea. I know that's one of those little books lost in all those other little books you can't ever find, but um, Hosea is the first of the minor prophets. So if you find Daniel in uh, the Old Testament, turn right, and Hosea is right after Daniel. We're going to be reading out of chapter 14. For those of you that may be here for the first time today, a few weeks ago we started a series entitled The God of the Valleys. In 2 Kings chapter 20, Israel was fighting the Amalekites in the hill country and Israel beat them up pretty badly. And one of the, one of the Amalekites came up and told the general, the problem is their God is the God of the mountains. He's not a God of the valleys. Let's get them down in the valley and we'll tear them up. And God told Israel, go down in the valley and let me show them who I am. And he did. And he showed himself that he is the God everywhere. And so we've been talking over these last few weeks about just different valleys that we walk through, different struggles, different problems, with the reassurance that God is there with us. And today, I want to talk to you about another valley that is universal, and that is the valley of disobedience. And um, when we stray away from God, as you're finding your place, I want to ask you this question. Have you ever found yourself in a season, I'm not talking about, oh, I said a bad word, God, I'm sorry, please forgive me, I won't do that again, or oh, God, I told a lie, I'm sorry, I won't do that again. But I'm talking about a prolonged season, maybe weeks, maybe months, maybe years, when your spiritual life was as dry as talcum powder, when you strayed away from God, when you got out of fellowship with God, I've been there. I know what that's like. And I'm sure many of you do. And the question is, when we get in that position, how do we get back? How do we get back? Well, I've got good news for you this morning. God is there in the valley of our disobedience. And that's what he says through Hosea to Israel. We're going to be reading chapter 14. Would you honor God's word by standing? It's the last chapter in the book of Hosea. And Hosea begins by speaking and saying, Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, take away all iniquity and receive us graciously that we may present the fruit of our lips. Assyria will not save us. We will not ride on horses nor Will we say again, our God, to the work of our hands? For in you, the orphan finds mercy. And then God speaks. And God says, I will heal their apostasy. I will love them freely. For my anger has turned away from them. I will be like the dew to Israel. He will blossom like the lily, and he will take root like the cedars of Lebanon. His shoots will sprout, and his beauty will be like the olive tree, and his fragrance like the cedars of Lebanon. Those who live in the shadow will again raise grain, and they will blossom like the vine. His renown will be like the wine of Lebanon. O oh, Ephraim. What more have I to do with idols? It is I who answer and look after you. I am like a luxurious cypress. From me comes your fruit. Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the way of, ways of the Lord are right. And the righteous will walk in them, but transgressors will stumble 
in them. God bless the reading of his word. Thank you. Please be seated. The book of Hosea is one of the most unusual books in all the Bible. I'll tell you why in just a minute. But Hosea was a, an 8th century prophet. Meant he, he ministered in the 700s B.C. Actually, the early 700 B.C. Before Israel had fallen... The Israel we're talking about here is part of the divided kingdom. You remember David and Solomon were kings in the United Kingdom. And after Solomon died, his son Rehoboam got some counsel that said, hey, you'd be just as hard, if not harder, than your father, and the people will follow you as bad advice. Rehoboam took their advice, and the people said, no, we're not going to do that. And one of Solomon's generals, Jeroboam, said, let's go. And so the ten northern tribes of Israel separated from the other two. And from that point on, Israel is referring to ten tribes in the north. Judah is referring to the two tribes in the south. And for political reasons, Rehoboam did not want the people in the north to keep, go back down to Jerusalem to worship because he said if they do that, ultimately they're going to rejoin Judah and we'll lose our political existence. So politics were involved in all this as well. So they reestablished a capital in the northern kingdom called Samaria, Jerusalem was the capital in the south. And we're talking about Israel. We're talking about these ten northern tribes who immediately, when they separated, they not only separated politically, but they began to separate spiritually. They began to worship Canaanite gods. They began to commit all the immoral and decadent acts that Canaanite gods were supposed to be worshipped by sacrificing children, their babies, by throwing them in bonfires to the god Molech, all kinds of immorality to the Ashtaroth and worship to the Ashtaroth. And so God is calling Israel to come back. He's calling them to return. And if they don't, they're going to suffer the consequences. Now, I told you that Hosea, Hosea is one of the most unusual books in the Old Testament. God often had his prophets do some act that when we look at it, we say, well, that's really bizarre. That's really kind of out of the box. But he did it to say, this is what's going to happen. And so when we open up the book of Hosea, one of the first things we see is God speaking to Hosea, telling him to go marry a prostitute. Now, we wouldn't think that God would be leading people to go marry a prostitute. But he told Hosea, you go marry this prostitute because my people have prostituted themselves. A little later on, God tells Hosea, go marry another woman. She's a married woman, but she's an adulteress. And he said, because my people have committed adultery against me. So Hosea did this, and he's preaching to these, this northern country of Israel, warning them, turn from your disobedience, turn from your ways, or we are going to perish. And they didn't listen. And so we find Israel being attacked by the Assyrian Empire. Now we typically date the Assyrians taking over Israel and bringing them into exile around 722, 721 B.C. But it actually started about 20 years earlier under two early Assyrian kings, Tiglath, Tiglath-Pileser III and and uh, uh, some other Assyrian king. 
Shalmaneser V. And they took away the best and the smartest and the youngest and the strongest and all those. They took those away, but Israel was still sort of intact until around 722 when two other Assyrian kings, Sargon II and his son Sennacherib, came down and destroyed Samaria and took away the identity of Israel. We call them after that time the ten lost tribes of Israel. But they really weren't lost. God knew exactly where they were. And God's calling them back. He's calling them to come back. When we look in the Old Testament, we see over and over and over and over again this cycle happening with Israel. And maybe you can you can kind of identify with this, but we see Israel is is blessed. They're, God's blessing them. They're 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 productive. They're fruitful. You know, things are going great. Supernatural things are happening in their presence, and then all of a sudden, Israel decides to disobey God. And they disobey God, they turn their backs on God, they start for, following foreign gods, they start doing other things, and then we see God disciplining them. And that discipline was painful. It oftentimes involved them being removed from their homes, removed from their land, Assyria, Babylon, other, other kinds of discipline. And then, after a while, Israel realizes, we don't like this. And they repent. And God takes them back. Now, we find that kind of cycle many times in our lives. God is blessing us. Things are going great. We're doing fine. And then suddenly, we take our eye off the ball. And we begin to think, well, this is going to just continue forever. doesn't matter really what I do. I mean, God's not going to care if I mess around a little bit. God's not, you know, he's not going to do anything. And we sin, and God disciplines. And we're in the valley. We're in the valley of disobedience. And God is calling us back. I don't know where you are today in your spiritual life. I have prayed more over this sermon than many others that I have preached. Because I want to tell you something. God wants you in fellowship with Him. And if your life is stale, if you're not walking with God, maybe you've gotten out of fellowship with God, maybe you don't even know whether you know God or not. This message is for you. And I want to tell you, God knows where you are. And he's calling you to come back and walk with him. That's the message from Hosea. And the first thing that Hosea tells the people is this. You, you need to know that God wants you to return to him. That amazes me. I don't know if it does you or not, but that amazes me that the God of the universe who created this whole thing, who is omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, all the other omnis you can think of, that God wants me to walk in fellowship with him. And he wants you to walk in fellowship with him. And so Hosea begins with these words in, verse, in chapter, uh, chapter 14, verse 1. He says, return, O Israel, return. It's an interesting word. Fifteen times in the book of Hosea, Hosea says, return. It means backtrack. Backtrack to that place where you once were. That's why I tell people many times, it's good every once in a while to take a pause 
and go back, if you can, to the very beginning of your life with Christ. You may not remember what the date was or exactly what you said or what, was, what, what you prayed or whatever, and then that, that doesn't matter. I don't remember the date. I remember it was on a Sunday. But I can remember in, my, in the mind of my heart, I can remember that Sunday morning kneeling down before a Sunday school chair with my mother in a classroom and saying, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and forgive me of my sin. And that started right there. That started my spiritual life with God. It's good to go back. And so Hosea, God is saying through Hosea, come back, return back to me. We look in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was prophet to the southern two tribes, to Judah. And in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah used that word a hundred times, 100 times. Return, Judah. Return to the Lord. Jeremiah is saying, God's door is open. He's inviting you. And I want to ask you this question this morning. We, we read that in the Bible, but I want to ask it to you right now in this 21st century. Why do we hesitate at such an invitation from a loving God to say, come back to me. Come back and fellowship with me. Come back and love me. Come back and let me love you. Why, why, do, we, why do we hesitate at that kind of invitation. This fear. Oh, if I go back, you know, tell them what God's going to do to me. What do you think God's going to do to you? If you have a recalcitrant, recalcitrant, I'll say it in a minute, recalcitrant, well, forget it. If you got a prodigal child that rebels against you, they leave home, they come back, and they say, Mom and Daddy, Please forgive me. I'm sorry. I messed up. I strayed away. What are you going to do? You're going to grab them by the lapel and say, you little dirty rat. I've been waiting for you to do that. You're going to eat spinach for the rest of your life. And, you know, no. Jesus told us what we would do. And Jesus told us what the Father does. In Luke chapter 15, when the Father had such a son, we call it that parable, the prodigal son, it's a misnomer. It's really the loving father. And the son leaves. He takes all the inheritance that he has and he wastes it and just totally insults his father's values. Ends up in a pig pen and says, I don't want to be here anymore. I want to go back. He rehearses his speech. I'm going to go back. I'm going to tell my father I don't even deserve to be his son. I'll work as a slave. Just take me back and let me eat the bread of slaves. So he gets out of the pig pen, brushes some of the mud off, and he starts the journey back home. And what does Jesus say when he gets far off? Now that tells us something. That tells us that father has been out there in the middle of that road every day. He's been looking. He's been watching. And when he sees that son coming, Jesus said, the father takes off in a sprint. And he runs to his son. And he falls on him. And he hugs him. And he tells his servants, bring a robe, put it on his back, put shoes on his foot, put, put a ring back on his finger. My son was dead and is alive again. I want to tell you, that's what God will do for us. That's what he'll do for you. If you're in a valley of disobedience, a dry spiritual valley, and you say, God, I want to come back, I want to tell you, the Father's looking for you. Amen. And he's going to fall on your neck, and he's going to hug you up. And he's going to say, you're my son. You're my daughter. You're a prince. You're a princess in the kingdom of God. And I love you. Maybe we don't do it because of shame. Oh, I could never tell God what I've done. Newsflash. God already knows what you've done. You're not, you're not breaking any news to him. He already knows what you've done. But he's ready 
to take you back. Maybe, maybe we're not doing it because the pain of disobedience has not become bad enough yet to cause us to get up out of the pig pen. I want to tell you this morning, the pain of straying away from God never goes away. It just gets worse. And God wants you to come back. Next thing Hosea says is that the first step in coming back to God is always repentance. He says to Israel, he says in verse, wor- in verse 2, he said, take words with you. In other words, think about what you're going to tell God. Take words with you and return to the Lord and say to him this, one, take away all my iniquity. Repentance always involves confession or admission of sin. Telling God, God, I've sinned. You can't approach God for forgiveness without owning up to your wrongness. A lot of people have problems with that. They think, well, I, you know, hadn't killed anybody. You know, hadn't, hadn't robbed a store. Hadn't really done any big sins. But we've insulted the character of God and we have turned against him. And just by the very nature that we've strayed away from him, that's sin. And so we come back and we say, God, I messed up. I've sinned. My daddy was not a theologian, but boy, I don't know. God somehow sent him to seminary or something. But when I was a kid, my parents believed in that scripture that you spare the rod, you spoil the child. Fortunately, I was a model child. It only happened once, but um, yeah, God, I'm sorry. That's a, joke. That's a joke. But my daddy would always do so. I, now, my mother, hey, if, if I messed up, my mother grabs the nearest weapon. Yeah, wooden spatula in the kitchen, don't matter, switch. And we had to sometimes go out and cut our own switches. I thought that's, that's just totally... People would say that's child abuse today. But my daddy would do something different. When I got in trouble and it it got to that point, daddy had his belly full and it's time now for corporal punishment. My daddy would always tell me this. He'd say, boy, that's what he called me when he, (laughs) boy, I want you to go in our bedroom and I want you to sit on the bed and wait there until I get there. (laughs) Kill me now. (laughs) Many times I sat in that bedroom for four and five days waiting for my daddy (laughs) to come in there. But I knew ultimately he was coming. And I'd hear the steps and the door would open Daddy'd walk in. I'm already a mess. I mean, he's already destroyed me, you know, just by going and waiting. But he'd spank me. But before he would spank me, my daddy always did this. He said, son, I want you to tell me why are you getting this spanking? He knew I needed to own up. Because I could have had the attitude, I didn't do nothing, you sorry fella. This is undeserved punishment. Child abuse. No. There was never any abuse. I deserved it. And many more that they never found out about. <laughs> I wonder when I get to heaven, are they going to know, the, remember those? And I don't know, hope not. But he made me confess. God says, you and I have to fess up. 
We have to get honest with God. But then the second thing, the second part of, of repentance is turning. It's an about face. It's saying, I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to do that sin. I don't want to get back in that valley. I don't want to get back separated from you. But let me tell you what. You cannot get out of that valley yourself. You cannot live the Christian life yourself. You and I need a helper. We need power. And his name is the Holy Spirit. But when we make that decision to make that turn, God's Holy Spirit, the paraclete, the helper, comes alongside us. And he says, come on. Let's walk this thing together. So, the first step is always repentance. But the second thing that Hosea taught to the Israelites about this, that that they needed to do is, and, and the problem they were in was because they replaced ritual with reality. Look in the in the last part of that verse two. He says, receive us graciously that we may present the fruit of our lips. That's kind of an odd phrase there. But what he's talking about is the fact that Israel had replaced a real relationship with God with rituals. Now, there's nothing wrong with rituals. We have a lot of rituals that we do. We're doing a ritual right now. I'm preaching a sermon. That's a ritual in our church. We sing songs. That's a ritual. We baptize people. That's a ritual. We take the Lord's Supper. That's a ritual. We pray. That's a ritual. We read the Bible. That's a ritual. There's nothing wrong with rituals. Rituals are meaningful things we do to remind us of spiritual truth and to remind us of God's will for our life. However, ritualism is the empty practice of dead faith. Ritualism is doing the right things, but we don't even know why. And we don't even think about them. And it's very easy to slip into that rut of ritualism for all of us. With everything we do, we can slip into ritualism coming to church. Well, it's a thing to do. It's Sunday. Go to church. Then go eat fried chicken. We can slip into uh, ritualism by reading the Bible. We sit down and read the Bible. We don't pay attention to what it says. Preacher told me I need to read the Bible 10, 10 minutes a day, so I set my timer. Oh, ding, I read it 10 minutes. I'm done. We can, we can be ritualistic, Dave, singing songs. You know, we just, those, man, those songs were so powerful today about how great God is, how magnificent God is. It should have, it should have just about burst your heart. Thinking about the majesty and the magnificence of God, but we, we know those tunes, so we sing them and we're worried about whether we're hitting the right note or not or, you know. How long is Dave going to repeat that verse again? And we don't think about what we're singing. We can be ritualistic praying. We just toss up a prayer to God, you know. Lord bless me, my house, everybody else. Amen. It's easy. It's easy to slip into the rut of ritualism. And Israel had done that. God said, you come back to me and you give me the fruit of your lips. In other words, I want you to be genuine. I want you to be authentic in what you're doing. And when you read my word, I I want you to open up your heart and say, dear God, speak to me. When you pray, I want you to pour your heart out to me. I want you to know I'm listening in the hall of heaven. And I want you to pray like you mean it. When you sing praises to me. I want you to fill your lungs. It's my air in your lungs. And you exalt my name. 
When we do that, church is fun. Church is fun. It's not dry. God's there. God inhabits that authenticity. The last thing that Hosea tells them is to renounce dependence on other things. Now, he's still telling the people of Israel, you tell God this. Put words in your mouth, tell God this. And in verse 3, he says, you tell God Assyria will not save us. What Hosea is saying is, don't put your dependence on outside things, outside yourself, beyond God. Assyria will save us. Let me ask you a question this morning. What are you trusting in for your security? Our arsenal of nu- nuclear weapons? Our government? The church? Somebody else? Your company? What are you trusting in for your security that's outside of yourself and it's beyond God? It's not God you're trusting in. So Hosea tells him, you tell God, no, no, we're not, we're not trusting in, in Assyria. And then he also says, renounce that dependence on your internal resources, things you have. Except God. So he says in verse 3, you tell God, we will not ride on horses. What that means is, we're not trusting in our military power. We're not trusting in the speed and the strength of our army, God. Our, our health, our intellect, our, our uh, uh, strength or talents. God, we're trusting in you. I fear one of the banes of America because we are so blessed. We put our trust in so many things other than God. Things we have of our own and things even that are outside of us that are not God. And Hosea closes with the good news. Here's the good news, guys. Listen. Hosea closes with God's response in that valley of disobedience. Look in verse 4. God's speaking now, not Hosea. God is speaking. And God says, I will heal their apostasy. It's interesting. He's talking about a spiritual a spiritual condition called apostasy, which means separation from God. But he says, I'm going to heal it. It's an illness. It's a spiritual illness. And it causes death. But God said, I'm going to heal it. I'll heal your rebellious nature. And then he says... I will love you freely. Isn't that an amazing thing? That the God of all the universe wants to love you personally and let you know how much He loves you. I had a pastor friend that pastored in Oklahoma City Church and he told me a story one day. He said, Jay, he said, this is the, in all my ministry, he was pastor for decades. He said, in all my ministry, this is the sor- most sorrowful story. Broke my heart. He had a couple in his church that were very faithful in his church, husband and wife. And they, they were always there. They served in all kinds of ways. And one day he, he's sitting in his office and he gets a call from the husband And the husband's hysterical. And he said, Pastor, I need to come talk to you. I'm in trouble. I don't know what to do. He said, come in, hurry. 
He goes in his office and he walks in with a piece of paper in his hand. He says, I came home today and my wife left this note on the table. And the note said, I don't love you anymore. I found somebody else. I'm gone. Don't look for me. And she had taken off her wedding ring. And she laid it on top of that note. And the man was just crushed. He said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how I can live. I love her with all my heart. She's the love of my life. I never saw this coming. Well, my friend prayed with him and tried to comfort him as best he could. He said, man, I, you know, I'm here for you. I'm here. Call me. We're going to pray God turn something around. The man left his office, and my friend told me he got a call about a week, week and a half later. Again, it's the husband. and Again, he was hysterical. And he said, Pastor, I need you now more than I've ever needed you in my life. My friend said, what happened? What's, what's going on? And he said, they found my, my wife naked in a hotel room about 100 miles from here. They're pretty sure foul play is involved. And he said, I can't go by myself. Would you go with me to get my wife? The pastor said, of course I will. They drove out there. Police talked to him, kind of explained what they thought might have happened. Lovers quarrel. Finally, they got the body released, funeral home, brought it back to Oklahoma City. And the man said, Pastor, I have no right to ask this, but he said, would it be possible for us to have her funeral in the church? The pastor said, absolutely. No problem. And they had her funeral. Very few people, if any people in the church, knew what had transpired in the last week and a half other than the pastor and that husband. When everybody left, the pastor and the husband were left there by themselves. And he said he walked up to the casket and the husband caressed her face and patted her on the hand. And then he took that wedding ring out of his pocket and he put it back on her finger. And he said, I will always love you. I want to tell you, a thousand times over, that's what the Father does for us when he calls us out of the valley of disobedience. Is that where you are today? God wants you back.